Good evening and welcome to the Seth Joyner Show. Yes, full hoodie mode tonight. Last week I started off with the hoodie and then I took it off feeling like there was some hope for the Eagles to rebound. I'm in full embarrassment mode tonight, so it's straight hoodie for the entire show. Welcome to the Seth Joyner Show presented by Bet Parks. And um, just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, trust me. It got worse. The Eagles trotted their behinds up to the Meadowlands last week and got taken apart by the New York Giants. The New York Giants. And man, I just, I, there's a side of me that I don't even know where to go with this. By the way, it is a talk to him Tuesday. So the majority of um, what we do here tonight will be me taking your questions your rants, your raves, your observations, and um, giving you, you know, your answers, the information that you want to know. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, as always, thanks for subscribing. Hit that like button for me, um, the comments. And again, most importantly, you know, for those who don't know, let them know. Go subscribe to the Seth Joyner Show. Um, all right. So let's jump into this thing. Um, the first thing that bothers me is where this football team is, you know, from a confidence standpoint, from a psychological standpoint. Um, how do you not get up for the New York Giants? Um, you beat them two weeks ago. And you come into this game knowing that, you know, there's a chance, you know, you got a chance. It's not probable, but there's a chance that you could get the division. Um, and you come in and you just essentially just lay an egg and, you know, listen, at the end of the day, you know, we can bemoan this thing a hundred different ways to Sunday. Um, but the players aren't giving maximum effort. And I just feel like, you know, the coaches are doing the players a disservice in you know, how they're being coached and what position you're actually putting them in to be successful. Um, there's so much going on around this team and the things that you hear people, the, the, the players say throughout the week, and it's becoming more and more telling, you know, for me. Hassan Reddick was asked how difficult is it, you know, to make the DC change, um, you know, and he talked about how hard and how difficult it really is to, um, midstream in week 14 go from one defensive coordinator to another defensive coordinator um, you guys heard me talk about it you know when the when the change was made i think that it was a massive mistake and it's wound up doing more damage than anything i feel like the um the defense is playing even worse now than they were under the side even with sean Desai, they knew what their responsibilities were and what they were supposed to do now they look extremely confused in what they're supposed to do. And I think that's part of what you're seeing when you talk about the effort, because in order for a player to go 100 miles an hour, he has to know unequivocally what it is that he's supposed to do in every single defense is called, what the checks are, what his run responsibilities are, what his pass responsibilities are. And it's pretty obvious to me that the changes that Matt Patricia has made to Sean Desai's defense um, has got these players utterly confused. Um, then you heard James Bradbury was asked, um, you know, the question sometime this week, you know, what do you see, the, what do you think the problem is and where do you think it went wrong? And his answer was the answer that I've been saying all along, Ever since the San Francisco 49ers game, this team hasn't been the same. I think that this team 
was psychologically, um, you know, beat up. And I, I, I believe that the San Francisco 49ers broke whatever confidence and whatever will this football team had left in them. They fractured them. And at the end of the day, it's up to Nick Sirianni to put all these pieces back together and figure out how to get them psychologically right and how to um, get them emotionally right and how to motivate them, you know, for what's at hand. And he hasn't been able to do it. Um, he was asked a question um, last week, I believe, in, in this press conference. You know, Nick, um, what do you think you got to do, you know, to get the guys fixed? What do you got to do to get the team fixed? And I was astonished, absolutely astonished at his response. He looked at the reporter and said, well, you know, don't you think if I knew um, what to do, if I had the answer, that we'd be fixed by now? That absolutely blew my mind, you know, that he would admit that he does not have an answer whatsoever. Um, and for 18 weeks, this has gone on. Now, I am not in the camp of talking about whether a coach should be fired or whether he shouldn't be fired. But I know that some of you guys are going to ask the questions tonight in the talk to him phase of the broadcast, um, you know, or have an opinion about it. And, you know, if there's a problem with him being able to fix it, and a lot of people have said, you know, hey, no, you don't make this, this change. You know, he's gone to the playoffs three years in a row with this team. you got to give him at least one more year to fix it. If he's not able to fix it now, Where's the confidence that he's going to be able to fix it over the course of the offseason and going into next season? What if the team falls into a rut again next year? Are we confident that he's going to be able to fix this football team, you know, moving forward? Again, I'm saying I'm not in the camp of talking about whether a coach should go or shouldn't go. But I honestly believe that if the Philadelphia Eagles fly down to Tampa Bay and take on the team that they already beat in week three, and probably their most impressive win of the season. Um, and they go down there and they get their behinds handed to them in a similar fashion to what the Giants did to them, then I believe that Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman have to sit down and have a serious conversation about whether he's the guy moving forward or not, okay? Again, I'm not saying he should go. I'm not saying he should say stay. What I'm saying is if he can't get this team motivated in a playoff setting to go down and play their best football and give maximum effort, if they go down and they look the way that they looked in Tampa Bay, like they looked in New York last week, then that conversation has to be had. And they need to, they, they need to evaluate whether he's the guy that's going to pull this team out of the abyss and be able to take advantage of the talent that they have specifically on the offensive side of the football and get it done. That's just a fact. There's just no getting around that, okay? Um, the players, you know, when you learn how to just decipher what they're saying, um, it's very telling. There's also, you know, some stuff floating around that, you know, one of Nick Sirianni's core competencies is um, connectivity. And there, one player was, I'm not going to point him out. One player said that, you know, it's not good right now. How can it not be good? Again, that's a leadership thing, you know, for the guys in the locker room to pull everybody together. But it also all, all begins with the head coach. What kind of environment are you creating, you know, to bring guys together? You know, I know that, you know, under Buddy Ryan, the thing that we did is we had barbecue and beer on, on Fridays. Now, sooner or later, you know, the players are going to abuse that. And certainly, you know, that's exactly what happened. One guy was going home, driving across the Walt Whitman Bridge, you know, a little intoxicated. And the owner said, hey, that's enough with the beer. You can have the barbecue, but no more beer. But the point that I'm trying to make is he tried to create an environment where we were together as much as we could possibly be, you know, tried to keep us in the locker room on a Friday when everything was done and practice was over by one, two o'clock in the afternoon, you know, the breakfast and beer, I mean, the, the barbecue and beer kept us in the locker room 
to four, five, sometimes six o'clock, playing video games, getting to know each other, hanging out. You know, the defense was always together. You know, Thursday was our night out. We went out to dinner together. The guys that hung out and party, they went out and partied. The guys that didn't, they went home to their families. Um, but he was always trying to create an environment where we were always around each other because, you know, I understand it much more now so than I did then, is that when you've got guys, you got 50-something guys on a roster, you're trying to bring them together as much as you possibly can. You're trying to create an environment where um, I care about the guy next to me because I know him and I know his family and I know his kids. And once we create that bond, I'm not just playing for me anymore, but I'm playing for that guy next to me. And I'm playing for that guy on the offense. And I'm playing for that guy on the special teams. And I'm playing for those coaches because we have that kind of connection. So when I hear, you know, this kind of rhetoric coming out of the locker room, it's worrisome. And, and it's very telling also for where this football team is. Next thing, Javon Hargrave comes out and talks about how um, hard it is to practice in San Francisco, how much more harder difficult practices are in San Francisco than they are here. Um, it's pretty much a country club environment in practice here. And that when they go to practice there, it's hard. You got to bring your hard hat to practice every single week. You heard Sidney, Sidney Brown say, hey, you know, what you manifest in practice, what you see in practice is what you basically see manifested on the field. That's from a rookie. If the rookie understands it, you mean to tell me that the coaching staff isn't pushing it and talking about it, that the veterans aren't pushing it and talking about it? He talked about the physical nature because you don't practice physically. You don't play physically. So there's the proof. You know, you're hearing the players talk about it. You're hearing things coming from the coach that kind of magnifies and tell you why this football team is where it is at this point in time. It's sad, but it's true. OK, once again, it's the Seth Jordan show brought to you by Bet Parks. Let's jump into some of your comments before we get to the whiteboard one on one session. All right. So James wants to know, should our cornerbacks begin with their hips more open and inside so they can more quickly get locked at the hips and in phase with wide receivers, especially outside cornerbacks and those um, on the left, given um, the quarterback arm? Um, no, because, you know, if you set your hips outside, you know, that's just not prudent. Because if you set your, you set your hips outside, then what winds up happening is um, you give the wide receiver a better opportunity and a better chance to set you up for him to get to go where he wants to go. Um, I think, you know, a lot of what ails the cornerbacks is, you know, they're put in a, in a passive posture, meaning that, you know, they're lined up eight to 10 yards off the line of scrimmage. I mean, I, I, I can remember looking at, you know, one play where the line, where the cornerbacks were almost as deep as the safeties. Now the safeties rule is anywhere between 12 and 15, 10 and 15 yards. More times than not, they're lined up at 12 yards. So if your cornerbacks are almost the same exact depth as your safeties, that's an easy throw for any quarterback in the National Football League. The other thing is, We've got to move away from, you know, in my opinion, you know, if what if what you've been doing all year hasn't been working, then that means that you got to make some adjustment. You got to make some changes. But when you come out there every week and your cornerbacks are lined up at 10 yards off the ball, you're sending the message to your opponent that this is how we're going to play. And you can have the slant routes, the out routes and the five yard stop routes all day long and the bubble screens to that side. So get your cornerbacks up in a much more aggressive posture um, and, and give them the confidence that they can play in a much more aggressive way instead of being so protective and living in this mode of, you know, Vic Fangio style defense where we're going to bend but don't break until you get to the 20 and then we're going to be more aggressive. You know, what's the difference if you're going to give away 80 yards and your team goes, you know, in between the 20s now they're already in position. You're not a very good, you know, red zone defense. So what's what's the purpose? Why not just play a much more aggressive 
brand of football, you know, in between the 20s. Because if you're not forcing the action, you're having the action forced upon you. You know, I'll ask you guys the question. When was the last time that you saw this defense create a turnover? And I use the create in term in tongue in cheek. Because if you hear anyone who really understands defensive football talk about turnovers, they talk about turnovers from the standpoint of them being forced. Okay. If you are playing passively and protecting against the explosive play, then you can't be two things at one time. You're either protecting or you're forcing. And the reason why the Eagles don't force a lot of turnovers is because they're in protective mode nine times out of 10. So they've got to be more aggressive so that they're in a more aggressive stance and they're in a position to force more of the action than they are to receive the lion's share of the action. So that now you're close enough to the receiver where like when the receiver punched the ball out of A.J. Brown's hand last week, we can do some of that, you know, where you can strike the the, the ball carry instead of having to be chasing him when he catches the ball. Um, playing your linebackers, you know, more aggressively at the line of scrimmage, you know, in the run game. I'm going to show you guys some things, in my opinion, that the Eagles can do. One of the things that they've had problems with is they haven't generated the kind of pressure. They're not generating the pressure because the the pass rush and the coverage goes hand in hand. If you're going to play your cornerbacks 10 yards off the ball, eight yards off the ball, you're certainly not going to get home because the corner, the quarterbacks have slants and out routes and stop routes at their disposal all day long to get the ball out of their hand, something that our offense doesn't take advantage of. You know, So if you're going to get a better pass rush, that means you're going to have to step up and play more aggressive on the outside and in the slot with your cornerbacks. And – you're going to have to take some chances and bring some blitzes from time to time. So in the one-on-one, I'm going to show you some line stunts and things that they can do and then how they can incorporate their linebackers in a more aggressive posture to help the pass rush get there and to help, you know, with some of the things that we lack in being able to do on the offensive side of the ball when teams show us pressure, whether it's simulated pressure or pressure that's actually real. Okay, next question. Jason wants to know, did they quit on their coach? Um, it's hard to look at, you know, what they put out the last two weeks and not realize or believe that they've quit. Um, I've heard some some people say in the media that, you know, the Giants made them quit. Um, you know, when, it, when you ra- wave the red flag and I get it, you know, A.J. Brown got hurt and that kind of signaled the beginning of, hey, um, we need our guys healthy for the playoffs. You know, Devontae Smith was already down. A.J. Brown goes down early in the game. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the time you get to halftime, Marcus Mariota's in the game. The backup offensive line is in the game. The younger guys on the defense is now in the game. So I guess, you know, you could say in a roundabout way that, you know, they did quit. And in the midst of, you know, being beat down, you know, the coach waved the, the white flag and took all the starters off the field. All right. Next question. Paul wants to know, where can I get the Davis Honda's merch? Hey, at Davis Honda. Um, <laughs> you like it? You know, um, I'm, Davis Honda is one of my sponsors. Davis Honda of Burlington. I'm pretty sure you can go in, not only get you a brand new Honda, but you can also get you one of these jackets or a golf shirt that says Davis Honda. All right, next question. <laughs> Mark wants to know, um, you think, we finally draft a linebacker this year. Um, you would think that the message has been sent. If there's anything ever more clear that, you know, there's an importance at the linebacker position and you need um, linebackers to make your defense go, that this is the year, you know, where you'll see it. See it. But, you know, if how he's going to do things, do business the way business has always been done, um, then my answer would probably be no. They'll try to solve this issue in free agency you know, and undrafted guys. And um, I just don't think that that's the fix. They need to go and get themselves a bona fide linebacker who's played the position, who started the, pos- the position, who's pl- probably started a minimum of two years in, in, at the college level and bring them in and groom them and bring them along. Next question. Alfredo wants to know any news on A.J. Brown. Um, you know, you guys know how Nick Sirianni and the Eagles are. They're not going to give you much of anything. Um, 
I would be I would be looking to hear through the media whether AJ actually practices tomorrow, whether he's full go or whatever their schedule is with the Monday night game. You know, maybe they, they just have a walkthrough tomorrow and they push a full practice back to Thursday. But I would look for, you know, information there, Alfredo, um, because Nick Sirianni is not going to give you anything. You know how he feels about, you know, giving out information like that. He's always seeking a com- competitive advantage. He believes that it's a competitive advantage not to give your opponent too much information early in the week. All right. Next question. Mark wants to know, do I think Michigan could beat the Eagles? Come on, man. Really? <laughs> Michigan got a good football team. They dominated last night. Congre- congratulations to you Wolverine fans out there. But there is no college team that's coming on the field with a professional team and beating that for that professional team. We need to stop that. All right. I know that was a little tongue in cheek, but there you go. Next question. Um, I don't know what you're Ken. Ken wants to know, in my opinion, um, there's been absolutely no next man up mentality, especially in these last eight weeks. Furthermore, I don't even know that it by miracle they make it. A little storm surge. We're here. It's all good. Um, you know, next man up mentality. Um, you got young guys that's having to step up in the next man up scenario. Um, and I'm not so sure that, um, you know, some of those guys are really ready to play. We didn't see a lot out of some of the young guys. A guy like Nola Smith, it, it was late in the year before, you know, we started to see him on a regular basis. You know, you, you got a guy, undrafted, you know, guy in Keely Ringo. Um, and Eli Ricks, you know, well, one of those guys I think was drafted, but the other one may have been a, a, a un, un, undrafted free agent. But, you know, the, the hard part about, you know, having to play young players is that they're learning the defense on the fly. They're learning the terminology on the fly. So the problem is, you know, there's a, a growth spurt, Sidney Brown. You know, they tried to put him out there early in the season. It didn't work. They had to pull him out, pull him back a little bit. And then there was a point in time where they had to play him. Slowly but surely, he started to come around. Just it's a sad situation that he tore his ACL. But that's what happens with young players. They're going to have some great plays. but They're also going to have some, some bad days. And you have to live with that. And when you're a football team like the Philadelphia Eagles, who are, you know, every all the chips have been pushed in the table – for this season to be another Super Bowl run, you know, you want to have as many experienced players on the on the field playing as you possibly can. All right. Next question. Um, Johnny wants to know, should the Eagles bank on Blankenship and Brown going forward at safety or do they need an upgrade? Um, I'm not so sure that they need an upgrade. I think Reed needs to do a better job of giving himself an opportunity and coverage uh, to be in a much better position. He's not overly fast. He's aggressive. He's smart. But, you know, when you don't have the benefit of speed, then you got to put yourself in a better a better position to be able to cover. You know, if he's running a four, six, a high four, five, and you're playing against guys that are running four, two, four, three, you know, in that back end, you better be backpedaling. You better be getting your depth. You better be doing all the things that a safety has to and needs to do to put himself in a position to make up for that lack of speed. Sidney Brown, listen, you know, he's you get injured at the end of the year. He's probably not realistically not going to be ready to come back, um, you know, until, you know, probably week six, week seven next year. And even at that, you know, even though his 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 body will be healed, he's got to come back and play enough and experience enough coming off the injury to, to psychologically heal. No, in other words, you know, the body can be healed 100 percent. And you can run around, you know, and practice and 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 training and all that stuff, and everything seems like it's okay. But at the end of the day, you really don't know until you get on the field. And you have to go hit somebody, or somebody hits you, or you get hit on that knee. Then you know, you know, then you can get over that psychological hurdle. But he's not going to get over that psychological hurdle, you know, for some time. So the Eagles may need to look in the draft, a look in free agency at one of the top you know, safeties that are available to, to shore up that position. All right. 
Next question. Adam wants to know, um, with our defense unable to stop anyone, when are they practicing against our offense? Maybe everything our offense does works. Um, thought. I don't know. You know, normally it doesn't work that way. The number two defense usually gives, you know, the offense a show, and the number two offense usually gives the defense a show. And and, the, and by show, I mean, you know, you got cards, they draw up plays that your opponents are going to run, they draw up defenses that um, that your offense is going to see, and offenses that your defense is going to see, and they run the plays that teams um, have a tendency and a proclivity to run on a, on a more – that, that, that they have that they've had success with um, and your game plan and you're setting your game plan based upon the things that they are most successful with. And you're trying to match defenses that take away what they do best offensively in the run and the pass game. And you're trying to take advantage offensively with plays that you think can defeat coverages and things that they do, you know, on their defensive side of the ball. So, you know, no, I, I don't think that, you know, that really flies. It doesn't necessarily work that way, in my opinion. All right. Next question. 17 Birds wants to know, was it too late in the season to draw up new play schemes after the Niners game? Um, that's a good question, because I don't think it's a matter of drawing up new plays. I don't think it's a matter of, you know, implementing a new scheme defensively. What I do have a question, a big question is, how extensive is Nick Sirianni's overall playbook? Because you put that playbook in, the entire playbook, you put that in, you install that during OTAs and during training camp. And, and that playbook, you know, for me, under Buddy Ryan, our playbook was about that thick, okay? And that's pretty extensive. That's everything. That's regular, all the sub packages, nickel, dime, um, you know, big nickel. Um, it's um you know short yardage goal line third down situations that's everything but once you get to a game plan when you set a game plan at the beginning of the week the game plan might not be any thicker than that right there and that's everything that's everything that i just explained to you so the question is how extensive is nick sirianni's playbook you know now last year they were pretty much an rpo read option team with options off of that and, and I felt like coming into this year was imperative for the playbook to expand to not only have the RPO in the in the read option stuff, but to also have some things where you open up the playbook where you got Jalen Hurts under center and he's dropping back. He's going to play action off of run plays. He's a pocket passer and having to operate from the pocket. So now if you expand your, your playbook in that manner, then Jalen Hurts is growing as a quarterback. Um, I thought that that was imperative for them to be able to accomplish this year. Obviously, their playbook isn't that ex that that extensive because what you're seeing from week to week is a continuate a continuation of what they've been running all all year long. And everybody thinks that you know they think I should say that if they execute it better, then they'll be able to you know have success. But sometimes you know you have to have a myriad of different things that you can run. And what are you doing off of the actions of what you actually run? Okay. If if if, Devon, if DeAndre Swift is going to line up to Jalen Hurts' right side, okay, more likely than not, he has to either run the ball straight ahead or he has to go across to the left, okay, unless they're going to pitch the ball outside. If you get him in the pistol, now, you know, you can be a lot more creative, you know, you can misdirection or you can bend him one way and bring him back the other off of a pull going that way. Um, you can run a counter plays off of that. There's a lot of different things that you can do, but the Eagles primarily line up with DeAndre Swift or whoever, whatever running backs in the game. He's either right of Jalen Hurts or left of Jalen Hurts. So that means that most pass play, most running plays have to go across the formation. And now you see what teams are doing is they're spiking their defensive tackle you know, on the plate, on the side that DeAndre actually lines up in, and he's shooting the gap and cutting the playoff and making the tackles in the backfield. It's just, you know, schematically, you know, they've got to do some different things, and they've got to give teams different things to prepare for. Every single week, the game plan always looked the same. The formations always look the same, and the outcome has been the same for the majority of the season, all right? One more before we go to break. Ron wants to know, hey, Seth, 
Is Jordan Davis living up to expectations in your opinion? Absolutely not. Um, we all knew that he was going to be primarily a run stopper. He came in in great shape in the early part of the season. He looked like, you know, he's taking a step towards being a, a good pass rusher. Um, but I think he's become disenchanted with how he's being used. And I'm going to show some of that to you, you know, when we come back after this break in the whiteboard session. You're going to line him up in a two or a one primarily in your four-man front. He's going to get double teamed, you know, primarily by the center and, and the, the left guard, okay? Now, he's a big boy. But when you got 600 pounds laying on you for the, for the majority of the game, it wears on you. And I think he's a little frustrated by that. I think at the other end of the spectrum, you know, he's not playing up to his best. People talk about them being tired and people talk about, you know, the um, the, you know, the hitting the wall. You know, it's 52 weeks in a year. Get your ass in shape so you can play 17, 18 weeks. That is nonsense. And most of these guys are only playing 55 to 65 plays a game. Not like when I played, you know, if they team ran 70 plays on you, you got them all if you were healthy. That's the way the game was. But now these guys, they rotate them in, they move them in and out, all of this stuff that goes on. And, you know, I don't want to hear about them being tired or being worn down because you get paid a king's ransom to play a game for 17, 18 weeks. And you mean to tell me that you can't come in and shape in the best shape of your life to be able to play as many steps as you need to play to be able to play, you know, a 18 games, a 17 game schedule over 18 weeks. Not trying to hear, it. not trying to hear. It, all right. All right. So after this break, we'll jump into our whiteboard session. Keep the questions coming. Keep the lights going, please. And, um, you know, if you guys are on here watching and you aren't subscribed, please subscribe over on YouTube. And um, we'll be back after this message. When you open the Bet Parks app, you're in the zone. Winning is always a rush, but the money is in the moment. It's the confidence and underdogs covering, the tension before a clutch turnover, and the pride of a parlay paying off. It's another chance to win big with all-day action. Plus, win your first $10 bet and get $125 in sports bonus bets. You play for fun, you love to win. You bet. Bet Parks. If you understand that success is built on trusted relationships and dependable performance, MidPen Bank is the right bank for you. We're on a mission to prove that the right bankers can make a big difference. We work harder, we get things done, and we're in your corner. With financial centers strategically located throughout the greater Philadelphia region and new locations in central New Jersey, we're ready to bring you the best in commercial and personal banking. Call or visit us today to connect with a professional MidPen banker. Member FDIC. Go Eagles! Welcome to Bridgeview Partners, where IT and business innovation merge. We're not just another tech company. We're your strategic partner in navigating the ever-evolving digital landscape. Our team of experts tailors cutting-edge solutions to fit your unique needs, and ensuring your success is our top priority. Elevate your business with Bridgeview Partners. Discover the power of partnership and tech innovation today. Contact us now to experience the difference. Bridgeview Partners, where innovation meets excellence. that I see on the offensive side of the ball and some things, you know, for the defensive side of the ball, more so for the defense than the offense. The biggest thing that the Eagles are having problems with right now is being able to pick up the blitz. Teams are blitzing them at an incredible rate right now, especially when they have success stopping them if they run the ball on first down or getting an incompletion on first down. Teams are coming after them on second and long to try to put them in third and long situations and force, you know, some, some lost yards. So, and the issue, the main issue that I'm having is with, um, you know, the philosophy of how um, Nick Sirianni, you know, has Jalen playing. A lot of people are talking about against the blitz. He's not seeing it. He's not reading it. Well, I beg to differ because I think if you look at it from a different perspective, you'll understand what I'm saying. And what I'm really saying is that the Eagles don't have sight adjustments built in to, um, to their defense. And I'm going to show you what that means. Okay. So here's your linebackers. 
Uh, Dallas Goddard, wide receiver. Wide receiver, let's go with a spread. You got your corners out here. Um, your slot corner. Um, uh, your, your fourth cornerback here. And then your safety, okay? So let me see, make sure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so when the Eagles are seeing blitzes, Okay, and this is what you get a lot of time. This guy will begin to show, and this safety will start to move over. Okay, and sometimes these linebackers even walk up in the gaps. So now you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven defenders, and you only have five guys to pick it up. So more times than not, what's going to wind up happening is you're going to get a free runner to the quarterback, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, because you've dispersed your offense and your, your offense in a way where um, you're man to man across the board. You got zero, zero coverage, you know, from a safety standpoint. Okay. So here you come, you got a slant here, this guy in this gap, he's coming here, he's here, he's here, he's coming here. And here's your free runner right here away from. So now when the Eagles see this, the tendency is they want to go after the explosive play. So a lot of times what you're seeing is you're seeing all goes by all the receivers here, okay? And this guy's running in here free with nobody to block him. And these routes are so deep that they're not even getting their head around to see if Jalen's going to throw him the ball. But my issue is right here with Dallas Goddard because I've seen it two weeks in a row now. And this is on Nick Sirianni. This guy's supposed to be covering Dallas, but when he starts to move to blitz, and the minute the ball is snapped, Dallas knows right now that his guy is gone, okay? So instead of running a go route and running to the coverage, I'm not understanding why they just don't sit him right down right now and Jalen just hit him. Now he's got a one-on-one -on -one tackle with his safety. And if the safety misses, it's a touchdown. It's a touchdown, okay? The other thing is, and I'm going to write right over top of what I got here, why aren't we – running him on a crosser and running A.J. Brown on a slant against man-to-man -man coverage. That route can't be stopped, okay? But it's the philosophy that the Philadelphia Eagles offense and their offensive coaches have instilled in Jalen that when we see blitz, specifically zero blitz, we're taking a shot down the field. Now, they got away with it last year because teams weren't aware of what they were doing. But now the teams have the blueprint that that's their mentality and that's their offensive philosophy versus blitz. They're coming after Jalen in spades. And they haven't adjusted routes, not one bit. Not one bit. Everybody's running go routes, okay? Everybody's running go routes. And the next thing you know, Jalen, Is we want the, we want you to make this one guy miss, okay? Even if he makes him miss, now he's on the run and the defense is pursuing. And if these guys don't get if these guys don't get open down the field, then he's throwing the ball away. How many times have we seen that all season long? It makes no sense whatsoever the way that they do this. This is the only offense, you know, that I can think of. And I played for thirteen years, and I've been in this business of. Of a, of, of a football analyst for another 10 years plus, I don't see offenses line up where a quarterback reads, pre-snap, an all-out blitz, and you don't have a hot route or you don't have a, um, you don't have a sight adjustment, especially off the guy where the blitz is coming from. It makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. None. Now, a lot of and, and you, uh, some of you guys have seen some of the stuff, some of the some of the stuff that's on social media, and you saw um, Jack Stoll against us. This same blitz right here, run a route and Jalen didn't see him wide open. Okay, but what I'm trying to tell you is Jalen's eyes are not trained to look at this guy right here. His eyes are trained for these go routes out here. And nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, the guy that he trusts most is number 11, okay? And that's where the ball is going. And teams know and understand that, okay? 
it has to be a fundamental shift and the fundamental change. And I, I find it's hard to believe that it's going to happen this week because they've been doing this nonsense all season long, all along. And they haven't adjusted, not one iota. And when, when the media asked Nick Sirianni about this, he evaded the question to them. He evaded it, which is nonsense. You, if your fingerprints are all over this offense, then do something to change it. This is unconscionable. It makes no sense whatsoever for Jalen Hurst to be always running and trying to play the hero role and figure out, oh, I, I got to make a play. I got to make one guy miss, and I got to make a play. All right? So let's jump over to the, um, to the defensive side of the ball, and I want to show you guys some things that I feel like the defense can begin to do to, um, to free up rushers and get some pressure on the quarterback. Um, so nine times out of ten, this is Fletcher Cox. And he's lined up in what we call a three technique, outside shade of the guard, okay? Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter. Jalen Carter is another one that, that plays this two technique right here. And most of the time, he's being doubled by these two guys right here, okay? Um, and then you have your in here. You got a linebacker and a linebacker, okay? Now, I know Fletcher, Fletcher for years. He got into it with Jim Schwartz about this. You know, them wanting him to just be a, a B gap blitzer, a B gap player all the time, a B gap rusher, I should say. What I don't understand is why you're not running your TNT stunt. They need to spike Fletcher down and wrap this guy around. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay. The second thing is why aren't we running some TE stunts? That's the tackle. And the end, where he bangs on the inside because he's going to set outside for the rush. Bang him inside, get up the field, stutter the end, and bring him underneath. Where's the TE stunt? Okay? You can do the same exact thing and run an ET stunt. You just tighten him down a little bit. He comes down hard right now because he's setting this way, believing that the tackle is going to take the A gap, okay? Bring him down, get up the field, and then wrap the tackle around, okay? Everybody in the league is running that. You very rarely see the Eagles run any of this kind of stuff. Now, here's some blitz ideas off of some of these things that I'm talking about, okay? Let's say that you've got, you got a, a slot corner here, okay? This is elemental type stuff, but it can help them in the run game as well. Here's your run blitz. When you feel like they're going to run the football, okay, you spike Fletcher down inside, okay, you wrap the tackle around to the opposite B gap, okay, you send this linebacker in this gap and this linebacker in this gap, you got him on the outside and him on the outside, okay? So every single gap is covered, A gap covered, A gap covered, B, B, C, C. Where are they going to run the football? And then you, more times than not, you got the safety that's coming down, okay? If you want to get a little more creative here, okay, instead of bringing the linebackers in that fashion, you can walk this linebacker down in the gap, okay? I don't know how many times we've seen our linebackers walk down in the gap and then drop out. Nonsensical. Because if you're not going to bring him sooner or later, the protection is going to say, hey, he's not coming. Let's not even count him. Okay? So now you got your safety. Let's say you're in halves, you're in halves coverage. Okay? You walk this safety down. This draws the double team off of, off of the tackle here. So this guy's got to step here, right? Send him there. Tackle here, run your run your um your ET stunt here, okay. This end up the field, bring him, send him. Okay. Have we seen that kind of creativity out of out of our um our our defensive coordinators all year? 
Safety comes down, he's got this guy in coverage. Okay? It's not that hard. And, and you can look and see that these are some of the things that teams are doing to us. But what you're also creating is this is a way on early rundowns to make sure that you got every gap covered and screw up blocking schemes across the board to the point where you got every gap covered. Teams can't run against this. Okay? So even though it might be a run blitz, if they go play action pass or they decide to pass the ball off it, you convert, you convert the run blitz into a pass blitz. And now you're on the quarterback quarterback right away. Now, you're not gonna be allowed, you're not gonna be able to do inside technique, jam the inside, force the outside release, and turn and run with the guy. Okay. This is what they're worried about more than anything. And that's why they don't blitz as much as they need to. But if you if, if you can't live like this, I mean, you can't live with this kind of fear. At some point in time, you got to tell this guy right here to knuckle up. You got to tell this guy right here to knuckle up. This is your guy. This is your guy. Okay. This is your guy. And count on that he's able to get it done. Other safety come down. This is your guy. He's going to have to block when he sees all of this. The protection is going to require him to stay in. And for the life of me, I just don't understand why the Eagles can't implement some of this stuff. If I can just draw this stuff up, up, up off the top of my head, this stuff resides in me from my playing days. If I can draw this up off the top of my head, you mean to tell me that Matt Patricia and Sean decide? Can't get on a whiteboard the 15 hour days every day that they spend at the at the complex and figure some of this out. Makes no sense to me. Makes no sense to me at all. What they're doing offensively or their fear that they're instilling in their players from a defensive perspective. OK. All right. Let's get back to our questions. DJ wants to know, would you bring in Charlie Gardner? Charlie Gardner, oh, CJ, hey, listen. They should have never let him go in the first place. He's on a one-year deal. Make your amends. Bring the guy back in. Now, um, I got some information that, you know, Denard Wilson was really the guy that could control him. You know, that he was a little bit of a problem. You didn't hear that on the outside, but I got a little bit of inside information that that's kind of what it was. The minute that Denard Wilson, they made the decision to go to um, Sean Desai, and let Denard Wilson go, that really sealed the deal for, for, um, for Gardner Johnson. But he's a hell of a player. He's an aggressive player. He is something that they're missing. Can you imagine that defensive secondary with him and Reed Blankenship back there? And they had played a whole year together. Figure out a way to bring the guy back. Sit him down, talk to him, and work out what you got to work out. He's a good football player. Because they've certainly you know, swung and missed in the draft. They certainly swung and missed in free agency. Kevin Byard is obviously cooked. He doesn't give you anything whatsoever, you know. So in my opinion, I agree. That's something that, you know, maybe Howie needs to revisit and try to figure out how you can get this guy, you know, seven, eight million dollars a year and get him back here. All right. Next question. Um, Rome wants to know, <clears throat> should we go back to the RPO game to get this offense kickstarted? Um, I wouldn't have never taken it out. You know, I get why they took it out. Jalen got hurt early and they wanted to protect him. They actually had him in bubble wrap from the word go. Um, he was sliding and giving up, giving himself up, you know, and, and everyone was wondering what the hell was going on the first two or three weeks of the season. And then he had the knee injury and that kind of precipitated them completely taking him out of the RPO game. Um, but if there's a way to, implement it back in you know i would do it but then again you know i'm not the one that wrote a five a, a 255 million dollar contract to your franchise player you know and maybe it's not nick maybe it's coming from upstairs hey we want to we got to protect our franchise quarterback we can't have him you know running balls and having guys taking his knees out and having big you know defensive linemen falling on him and linebackers trying to blow him up you know I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I think if I think that if it was that simple, according to what Nick Sirianni said, if it was really that simple, 
then they would have made the adjustment and done so by now. Maybe he doesn't have the authority to do it because Howie and Jeffrey are directing him not to run that, that part of the offense. Don't know. Next question. PP wants to know a question. Do you think they would trade Jalen? Not a chance. Who are you going to go get for him? You know, th this, this like drives me insane that we can be in love with Jalen as a quarterback last year and all the great things that he did last year. And then because he struggled this year, not solely on his own, but because of how he's been coached and what he's been asked to do. And now we want to talk about trading our franchise quarterback. There's not a whole lot of quarterbacks out there that you're going to be able to go out and bring in. What are you going to do? You're going to draft another young quarterback? That's going to cost, cost you, you know, two, three years of development before you're able to, you know, be competitive again. There's not a whole lot of C.J. Strouds out there. Ask Bryce Young. Look at Bryce Young. He's not doing what C.J. Stroud has done. You go back over the years, how many quarterbacks have been able to do it? The only two that I can think of, you know, that come to mind in recent times is Justin Herbert and Lamar Jackson. And Lamar Jackson was able to do it because he was basically running, you know, the RPO and read option, which he had played his entire life. So if you think that getting rid of Jalen Hurts is going to fix the situation, you're crazy. You're crazy. If you put him in the right situation, and you coach him up right, and you give him the right tutorship, and you allow him to grow, and you do everything you can as a staff to help him grow, he can be a top five quarterback year in and year out. I believe that. Now, if you got some of you guys don't believe that, that's on you. you you're entitled to your opinion. But according to what I see and what I believe about him, I think he's a winner, and I think he's their franchise quarterback. They got to do a better job of going out and getting them some damn coaches that can help them be successful. All right. Next question. Greg wants to know what linebackers do I like coming out? Greg, I, I, I'm not even there yet. I watch a lot of college football. I know there's some good college linebackers out there right now. Um, I know that Trotter's son is available. I'm not even sure if he's the, 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 the top linebacker coming out. I think he might be two or three. Um, I don't know enough about these guys yet because I haven't, you know, with the season going on, I haven't even began, you know, that evaluation process of the linebackers that's actually coming out in the draft this year. So I, I, I couldn't tell you, you know, maybe in one of my podcasts in the offseason, um, as we start to approach the draft and the new fiscal um, NFL year, you know, by then I'll have a little bit of work done. And I can give you an idea of, you know, who I like. All right. Next question. Mark wants to know from my personal experience, do I think running or throwing is better against the blitz? Well, if you come with an all-out blitz, especially a zero blitz, um, all the gaps are going to be covered. So you're, you're really not, it's not advantageous to you um, to bring, to run the ball off of blitzes. I, I will say when you're playing against teams and, and the Giants did a lot of it, you know, on Sunday, they did a lot of blitz simulation where they made it seem like they were coming and then they dropped out. Um, I do believe in those situations when if the Eagles get in a situation where they have to pass the ball because they're down in the game, um, I believe that a delayed draw from time to time is a play that can be a big hitter. Because when you simulate pressure, you know, and the ball is snapped, guys are turning and getting out. So your linebackers aren't standing at four yards and reading what's going on. They're up in the line. And when the ball is snapped, they're turning to get out in their drops. Now you can go a delayed, you know, draw every once in a while, I believe really puts causes pressure on your on the pass rush, especially the defensive ends that are getting up field and your linebackers. Um, but depending on what type of blitz you're getting, absolutely. Um, the passing game is the way to go. They just need to implement hot reads and um, they need to implement hot reads and sight adjustment into this offense. They just don't have it. I don't understand. If you've got De DeAndre Swift in the backfield or Kenneth Gainwell in the backfield and the guy that's responsible for covering him um, in, a, in a simulated blitz or – um, in a situation where the safety has to come and pick him up, I don't understand why you just don't shoot him to the flat right now and throw him the ball right now. It's a foot race, you know, especially if he's simulating over up up in the line 
and now he's got to get out, just widen him out a little bit, snap the ball, and the minute you snap the ball, he goes straight to the flat, and you throw him the ball on an arrow route. I don't understand why, you know, we don't utilize some of that. He can, you know, Jalen can certainly utilize some of that. But again, it comes down to coaching, you know, because the players can only do what they've been coached to do. Um, and if you don't have it as part of your offense and a part of your adjustment package, you know, what is Jalen going to do? Make it up as he goes? You know, we've seen how that went. AJ talked about it last week. Hey, you know, <clears throat> Nick Sirianni is our guy, you know, um, you know, love the fact that he took the bullet for us, you know, in the Seattle game. You know, we kind of went rogue and um, improvised on a play. You can't play football like that, man. You know, the coaches have to put together a plan and they got to prepare the players for every case and scenario and then put it on the quarterback to know what to do and when to do it and to execute it. That's the way, you know, this thing works. All right. Next question. Um, Based on wants to know, do you think we will win in Tampa? Um, I'm hoping beyond hope that, um, you know, the way that Chad Johnson feels, he says, Hey, you know, they've been playing possum, you know, they're going to get it together and really show the NFL what they're made of. Listen, Nick Sirianni's comment, you know, if I knew, you know, how to fix the problem, I would have fixed it a long time ago. Um, the evidence of how they played you know, the last five out of six weeks going one and five after starting 10 and one. Um, we can all hope, but I just don't see it. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't see where they're going to make the adjustments and get right in time enough, you know, for this game. Listen, Tampa Bay has got 2,000 yard receivers, they got a running back. It's right on the cusp of, you know, a thousand yards. And Baker Mayfield's thrown for over 4,000 yards this year. You know, this isn't the team that they played back in week three. You know, the Eagles are trying to get right and they got right at the right time against a team who was trying to get right themselves with a first year quarterback trying to get acclimated to, you know, to all his weapons and the offense and whatnot. This is a different football team. It's a different team. If you sit back and you let, um, Chris Godwin and 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 Mike Evans run through, you know, your defense. Monday's going to look just like it did the past two Sundays. OK, so I don't really hold out a lot of hope. I don't hold a lot of a lot of hope that, you know, Nick Sirianni is willing to make the necessary changes, you know, to help Jalen in this offense to run the football, to take the short passes, take what the defense is giving you. Um, go some play action, put put Jalen under center so you can go true play action from time to time. Stop living in 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 um in shotgun all the time. Um, you can even run if you want to run play action, you can run it out of pistol. But the Eagles don't run much of that. They just don't. You know, I want to see him line up in two tight ends with Jalen under center and run some, you know, run some stretch plays and 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 run some some bootlegs off of that and some misdirection stuff and some play action stuff. You know, I've been calling for it all season long. They haven't done it through 18 weeks. I find it hard to believe that they're going to make the out of the blue. They're just going to make the adjustment and do it, you know, this week, you know, hoping, hoping beyond hope, you know, hope they can do it, man. I really do, but I don't see it. Next question. Sean wants to know, um, do you podcast these shows? I looked on Spotify and the last episode there was from 2020. We'd love to see these. I'm in the um, process, Sean, of, uh, of making sure that I get them ported over. So you'll be able, you know, hopefully um, by the time we get to the new fiscal year, I'll be porting these over to um, Spotify, um, iTunes, you know, and all the places, you know, where you guys like to go and, and, and um, audio leave um listen to you know the podcast i got you man i'm on it all right next question philly power man wants to know what do you think of brian flores and brian johnson pairing hypothetically um brian johnson i mean I, i'm i'm trying to understand are you talking about brian johnson remaining as the offensive coordinator i think if nick sirianni stays there's a good possibility that brian johnson stays as far as Brian Flores is concerned, 
I would love to see, you know, a Brian Flores or a Wink Martindale, you know, hired as the new defensive coordinator here because they're more aggressive, you know, in their mindset of how you play. I just don't think that philosophically from a defensive standpoint that that's how Howie Roseman and Jeff Lurie believe that you should play um, defensive football. Now, I find it hard to believe that that's, that, that, that that could be true, but you saw it with Jim Schwartz. You saw it with Jonathan Gannon, and you're seeing it now with um, Sean Desai and now um, um, Matt Patricia. So that leads me to believe that, you know, they believe that that's how defense should be played. That's hard for me to fathom knowing that, you know, um, Jim Johnson was a defensive coordinator here for so many years, God rest his soul, and how we tutelaged under Joe Banner, who was also the GM here when Jim Johnson was here. So where the shift came in that the psychological or the, or, or the philosophical um, way to play football is a bend but don't break, protect from big plays, and then once you get in the red zone, now we'll play a lot more aggressively. Um, I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that organizational shift happen i don't know whether it could possibly be a um a data analytics metric you know because we all know how much jeffrey and howie love analytics and how much they put into you know the analytics of the game and how they believe that that really drives the game you know but i think that they can honestly if they're honest with themselves they can look at how they played over the last you know five years and realize that that brand of football from a defensive perspective, you know, it isn't efficient. I don't think you can win that way. You know, I think you have a, you have to have a good mixture of aggression and passivity. And as a coach, you got to know when to do it. You know, the examples are Wink Martindale, Brian Flores, Brian Flores is, is just ridiculous. I mean, dude, he blitzes almost 53% of the time. The other guy that I like that 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 does it is um, I completely lost my train of thought. Um, Brian Flores, Wink Martindale, Steve Spagnuolo for the uh, for the Chiefs, and I think a lot of what Steve does in a lot of ways is because they don't have the pass rushes in Kansas City um, that they used to have on the outside. They've got one notable guy. They've got you know. Um, Kaloftis, you know, who's coming along, but you know, for the longest, they haven't had the pass rushes that they needed, so they've had to blitz a lot more often. But Steve Spagnola is a lot more aggressive, you know, than people give him credit for. All right, last question before we shut it down for the night. Charles wants to know Do I think Mike Vrabel will be a good fit for head coach or defensive coordinator? Um, let me give you my take on head coach. I don't think that the Eagles are going to move on from Nick Sirianni come hella high water. I believe that they need to evaluate it, especially if the Eagles go to Tampa and fall flat on their face. But I don't think that they're going to move off of Nick Sirianni no matter what, because then that would be like admitting that they got the hire wrong, even though he took them to the Super Bowl last year in the playoffs the other two years. Um, and if there's one thing that you know about this organization, they like to be right in the decisions that they make. We've seen that through Mac Hollins, um, JJ Ortega Whiteside, Jalen Rager, you know, they don't move off of guys until the bottom falls all the way out because, you know, they don't like to give the impression that they made the wrong decision um, as far as a player or a coach is concerned. Um, we, I, I didn't see the end that the second part of that question. Um, As far as defensive coordinator is concerned, I'm hard pressed to remember um, him as off uh, as a defensive coordinator and how good he actually was. Um, he comes from the Bill Belichick way of doing things, and Bill's not an overly aggressive, you know, defensive mind. Um, but I gotta imagine he had some kind of success to be able to parlay being a defensive coordinator into becoming a head coach for as long as he's been the head coach. Um, for the Tennessee Titans. Um, so I, I'd have to go back and look at, you know, 
some of the defenses that he's coordinated and see, you know, what their philosophy is before, you know, I actually answer that. But, you know, listen, everything's on the table. There's no doubt about it that there's going to be changes. There's going to be wholesale changes across the board. It would not shock me, you know, to see um, Brian Johnson either demoted back down to quarterback's coach and somebody else take over the play calling or him being relieved of his duties as offensive coordinator. And it certainly wouldn't in the slightest bit um, surprise me to see not only Sean Desai gone, but Matt Patricia and every other coach on that side of the ball gone because they need a defensive overhaul. They need some coaches, and I'm sure there may be some coaches over there. It's hard for me to see it in the linebackers, and it's hard to see for me to see it you know, in the secondary and their technique and how they play. But I get the sense that, you know, those guys that are coaching those two positions are good X's, X's and O's guys, but they're not very good teachers of the position. And you guys heard me talk about it last week. That's what the young players that they draft need more than anything is someone that can teach them and drill them on technique and fundamentals and how to play the game. And if they're not getting something done to show them how to get it done instead of just giving them the X's and O's and saying, go do it. It doesn't work that way. Players have to be developed. And one of the things that the Eagles haven't been done very a very good job at is developing their talent. Don't believe me? Look at the talent. A.J. Brown was already established as a number one wide receiver in the National Football League. Um, Devontae Smith came in here as skilled as any wide receiver in the National Football League last year, having played at Alabama. You look over on the defensive side of the ball. Hassan Reddick. Already came here with a skill set. Um, um, the two tackles from Alabama already came here with a with a skill set. So I, I I want somebody to tell me, you know, beyond Jalen Hurts and and Dallas Goddard and you know Jeff Stoutland is completely off the board because he is an absolute genius. Okay, what other players? What other position? have the Eagles drafted and developed and they've turned into, you know, a Pro Bowl or a top-level player. There's just not a lot. And specifically on the defensive side of the ball, at the positions of linebacker Darius Slay, already developed, came over from Detroit. James Bradbury, already developed, came over from the Giants. I, I'm, 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 I'm kind of making my case here, you know, that the Eagles always have to go and get players from somewhere else who've already de already been developed and already has a um, a skill set and techniques and fundamentals and bring them into the fold and plug them in. Okay, Quez Watkins. Quez Watkins been on this team what three, four, five years? Last week was the best game I've seen him play since he's been here. I don't know where the hell that's been since he's been here. 98 yards, 93 yards worth of receptions last week for Quez Watkins? I get it that everybody else was out. But, man, where's that been? Where's that production been? Where's that want to and that, that kind of production been, you know? So when you talk about, um, you know, building this roster and continuing to build this team, you know, there's very few players. And I see, yeah, T.J. Edwards, they developed, but now he's gone. What have they done? with the guys that they had this year. Have they developed them? No. You know, so when you look at those positions, you know, you got to ask yourself, you know, am I just getting the X's and O's guy as, as, a, as a position coach or am I getting a teacher, a mentor, you know, um, someone is willing to get to know each and every player and how and what motivates each and every player to play at their top skill and their top level every single week. Um, so don't be surprised if you see a lot of wholesale changes, not only in personnel when the season is over, but also, you know, um, on the defensive side of the ball, all the way across the board, all the way across the board. But we'll save that for after the Eagles get eliminated from the playoffs. Hopefully it won't be this week, um, but um, somewhere down the line. All right. That's the show for this week. Um, you guys. Um, Let's root these Eagles on, try to figure out a way to give them some energy. They seem like they don't have a whole lot right now. But as we wrap up the show, I want to thank you guys for the comments. I want to thank those who came in today and um, 
and subscribe to the show over on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Thanks for the comments. Great to be with you guys tonight. And as always, take care of each other and be good to each other. But most important, make sure you love each other. I'll see you guys next week right here, same place, same time, hopefully preparing for San Francisco um, rather than preparing for the boys making tea times and going on vac take vacation. I'll see you guys next week. Peace. Are you selling your investment real estate? Are you interested in deferring your tax with a 1031 exchange? At RevX, we're experts in 1031 exchange planning and the use of passive real estate options using DSTs. Not in the midst of an exchange and want to invest in real estate, but don't know where to start? Revolution X has institutional grade real estate options for any size investor right now. Set up a consultation at RevXWealth.com. RevX, defer the tax, maximize the gain. At Mandrakia Law, we win big personal injury cases, but we always tell our clients up front that those cases almost always hinge on how much insurance coverage people or companies have. At Mandrakia Law, we don't sell insurance, but we're experts at helping our clients make sure they have the right insurance to protect their businesses and families. Do you have the right insurance? Most people don't. For a consultation, visit mmattorneys.com or call 610-584-0700. Mandrakia Law, aggressive attorneys who get the job done. This is Seth Joyner, top analyst for the birds. I've also analyzed the best auto dealerships, and I drive a Davis Honda. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. Over 300 cars available. And right now, get rates as low as 0.9% at Davis Honda in Burlington. Plus, you'll get two years of free oil changes on every new and used Davis Honda vehicle. See why Davis Honda continues to win outstanding awards for sales and service, including the highest award from Honda, the President's Award. Get to Davis Honda in Burlington. Fall into savings at Davis Honda. J.P. Mascaro & Sons is a family-owned, locally operated, Operated solid waste service company in business for over 60 years. You've seen the red trucks with the blue elephant that symbolizes strength and reliability. Mascaro is different than other national brands. Like the birds, Philadelphia is home. They'll take care of all your waste removal needs. They have it all. An experienced workforce, state-of-the-art equipment, a cutting-edge recycling center, and their own disposal facilities. Call 888-MASCARO or visit jpmascaro.com.